CNBC TV 18. Hello and welcome to On the Record with me, Shireen Bhan. Uh, Indigo Airlines has delivered a stellar set of earnings. It's a record revenue, record profits and record EBITDA margins as well. Joining me now to talk about uh, the quarter gone by, but more importantly, the flight path ahead is the man in charge, uh, Peter Elber. It's always a pleasure. Many thanks for joining us here on the record on CNBC TV 18. Thank you, Shireen, and a very good evening to you. Well, uh, Peter, let's start by talking about the, the standout quarter that you've been able to deliver on. The question, though, is, uh, is this sustainable? Are you going to be able to replicate the kind of margins which have come in at a record high of almost 31.2% record revenue as well as record profit? In terms of demand and in terms of the external environment, will you be able to redo this performance? Well, it, indeed, this result uh, for this quarter has been actually a, a wonderful and very, very strong result. And a lot, of, a lot of things were coming together in this quarter. And if you take a little bit of a step back uh, at COVID, we had pretty much 10 quarters of consecutive losses. Uh, and um, by the end of, uh, actually by the middle of last year, as from the third quarter, we are back into profitable, uh, profitable territories. So now for three quarters in a row, we are back into black black numbers, black figures, uh, and this quarter obviously has been the highest one from the three. And what we see really is a combination of two factors. Um, firstly, we see a very strong uh, demand in the market. The Indian economy is growing, Indian travel is, go is growing, visitors are growing. So a very strong market demand in India does not only have one of the, the fastest recoveries post-COVID in the world, but also a very solid demand going forward. The second factor really what is helping us is that we have launched a whole range of initiatives last year and we see that all these initiatives start to pay off. So this combination of a strong, strong market on the one hand side and a lot of initiatives including a very strong operational performance are really helping us in, um, in creating such, such a good result. We're not making any prediction what's going to be the precise result next quarter and there's always some seasonal fluctuations in the results. But the foundations, what we're doing as a company, are really, are really very strong. You know, speaking about what's happening in the market, and I, I, I uh, thought you would address that in terms of factors that are possibly helping you as well. We've seen significant amount of capacity being squeezed out of the market. Uh, you know, go first. Uh, there is no clarity on when it is likely to relaunch. There is no jet airways at this point in time. SpiceJet is facing its own set of troubles, as are you on the supply side. But how much of the capacity constraints are actually aiding you at this point in time and what could that potentially mean in terms of market share addition? Yeah, well I, I think we prefer to look at Indigo at what we can do and, and how we are able to help uh, the market with the capacity what is needed. And since we had the first challenges in the middle of last year with some of the supply chain challenges forcing us to take some mitigating measures. We've been very, very consistent actually in meeting our capacity guidance. We've, we've given a, a guidance for last year. We've met the guidance even slightly higher. We've given a guidance for this year and the call which we had earlier uh, today, the North mid teens are just repeated. So what we have actually in place at Indigo is a whole range of mitigating measures, some of extension of leases, and uh, we are, of course, um, in a situation whereby we do have a steady flow of aircraft coming in. To your question on, on Go First, yes, the, the, the suspension of Go First flights in, in early May created, of course, some certain, uh, certain market disruptions and dynamics. However, I should say, after a couple of days, you see that things are, are, are stabilizing. And for us, for the 400 plus domestic routes we're flying, there was like 15 to 20 percent of these routes were also operated um, uh, by Go First. So the actual overlap on our on our on our network was was limited, I should say. The the majority of the growth what we're seeing is really the growth of the market. And if you just compare today's market numbers to that of the situation uh, before COVID, we're actually significantly higher. And for us, year over year, we almost had a 30 percent growth in terms of passenger numbers. So that's really new market. And, and we keep seeing, and that's one of the, I would say one of the strongholds of Indigo, we keep seeing a lot of first time flyers uh, 
in our aircraft and the, the very strong government policies in promoting air travel and making sure that smaller communities have access to air travel, that's really uh, supporting the growth of aviation in India itself. Uh, yes, I understand that the market itself is growing and of course you continue to be a clear market leader. But Peter, you know, you talked about go first and, and I would like to address the, the rumors and reports appearing in, in the regional press that suggest that Indigo might be interested in go first. Is there any truth to that at all? Indigo is focusing, again, I'm, I'm not reacting to any rumors, but Indigo is focusing on develop uh, our own company. We have a steady flow. I mean, even before we placed the most recent mammoth order of 500 aircraft, we already had 470-ish aircraft yet to be delivered. So we're in a strong position to build our company and build our brand, and that's really our focus going forward. Okay. Uh, Peter, you know, uh, let's talk about some of the challenges that uh, you need to contend with as well. And I know that you addressed this on the investor call. So I'm just trying to get a little more clarity from you uh, on the Pratt & Whitney recall aspect. Uh, in the first phase, Pratt & Whitney has announced that starting September, they will recall about 200 aircraft globally. Now, you've said that that will impact Indigo uh, in single-digit numbers. Uh, you already have 40 aircraft grounded currently. So starting September to perhaps the end of the year, which is part of the winter schedule that you have to factor in, what will be the operational fleet size? What will be the grounded fleet? Yeah. Well, today, and, and we, we said we have the high, in the high 30s of AOGs, and today I think we communicated that, that we're having around 40-ish aircraft, um, which, of course, is driven by the supply chain. In addition, uh, and that, that number is actually pretty stable over the, over the, past, uh, the past time, um, that most recent announcement uh, of the first batch of 200, I mentioned a single number, or single digit number actually, for Indigo, so that, that for, the, for the weeks and the months ahead will not have a, a very significant impact. Those are the numbers we, we can deal with within our capacity guidance. And, and again, today, even for the full year, we have repeated our capacity guidance of the North mid teens So we don't know yet precisely what's going to be the, the next phase of the, of the Pratt um, um, uh, inspections to take place. We don't know precisely what's the impact of that. We will work closely with Pratt whenever we have more information, whenever we get more information. We would like to be totally transparent. That's why we shared in our investor call whatever info we have, we share there. I think it's important to be transparent. Um, and of course, we are working, like we did last year, on the range of mitigating measures, such as extension of leases and the two wide body damp leases we're having uh, from uh, Delhi uh, to Istanbul and Mumbai to Istanbul are clearly also helping. So a range of measures, a range of initiatives and a stable capacity guidance. In other words, uh, we continue to execute what we planned to execute and we'll deal with this uh, together with Pratt how to find more mitigating measures for that. Right, uh, I, you know, and I expect uh, that as you get more information, you will be able to share more clarity on this issue. Let's talk about the other challenge. And, you know, it's, it's actually uh, been a better environment as far as crude is concerned, and you've seen the benefits of that play out for you in the quarter gone by. But we've now started to see crude prices inching up, and that's resulted in ATF moving higher as well. Uh, how much of a risk factor uh, is that at this point in time? What are you penciling in? Well, there's, there's, there's obviously some global uh, fluctuations in the prices of fuel and, and indigo, um, of course, is just, is just affected by these global fluctuations. And one quarter, the, the, the effects are positive, and another quarter, they could be negative. So I would not be in a position to, to predict or to speculate. And I think I've said that before, I'm not sure to you, but if I were to be able to have a precise prediction for oil prices, I probably would not run an airline, but would have a different job. Um, so so we, we just follow actually here. I think in the long run, actually, we see that there's always a correlation between fuel prices and actual prices of tickets. Um, you mentioned ATF. I think what's an important element in India today is that more and more states and more and more stations actually, as part of the government policies, are lowering the taxation on, on, on the ATF and, and aligning that. That helps a lot in order to, to make sure that India becomes more and more a global aviation hub. And we're not only looking to, to passengers within India itself, but even passengers traveling to and from and via India. And more and more we're building 
uh, that connectivity and that connectivity system. And that in itself will also help us to mitigate some of these fluctuations in prices which take place anyway. You know, you talked about the aspiration of making India a global aviation hub. Uh, and I want to ask you this in the context of what we're seeing play out uh, in the NCLT, etc. And there have been different representations uh, being made on the rights of the lessors. Uh, one of the concerns is that there is a crisis of confidence within the lessor community. Uh, how are you reading that? How is that likely to impact agreements going forward? Uh, you know, are, are we already starting to see that being penciled in as far as security deposits are concerned, change in uh, uh, agreements at this point in time? How do you see this playing out for India in the medium term, given the current environment? Well, I think we should, we should probably make a bit of a differentiation between what's, what's the trend in the direction and what are our actual situations. And the trend in direction of India is that India will, will grow as an economy and India will take a even more prominent place on the, on the global stage and as we basically see uh, that growing by the day. With that, the Indian aviation market will continue to grow and actually whatever prediction uh, you follow and being at the IATA conference um, a little less than two months ago in Istanbul, it was all about India looking at the air show uh, in Paris where Indigo announced its order and, and Air India did it slightly before that. Uh, it was all about the growth of the Indian market. So the general direction and the general focus on India uh, becoming such an, an, an vibrant uh, aviation market, that is there. Then of course there's the situation around, around Go First, which we follow closely, where it's important that, that um, it's, it is matching uh, some of the international uh, standards and, and practices. Um, so I, I think it's a bit premature to now connect the two and say, because of this, that will happen again. What is important is what is the, what's the long-term perspective and how some of the, the, uh, the actual situations, which I think it's still under development, it's probably not totally, um, totally worked out. There's still some work in progress and some discussions going on, to my understanding, without being aware of all the details, which are, of course, taking place behind closed doors. I think the overall direction is clear and, and India will continue to be uh, developing as a, as a global aviation powerhouse. Uh, yes, uh, and not just behind closed doors, uh, a lot of that is also uh, in the courts at this point in time. But Peter, you know, you talked about uh, India's place in the global aviation market and uh, we have seen uh, its position consolidating. You spoke about those two big orders, yours and the one that's coming from Air India as well. So I want to focus now specifically as far as your own international plans are concerned, uh, because when we last spoke, you did say, uh, say that you wanted to aggressively now amp up uh, your international expansion plans. Uh, given where capacity is uh, and your aspirations, what should we now expect in the next few months, uh, uh, perhaps over the next year? Well, what, I think one of the things is at Indigo is we say what we're doing and we're doing what we're saying. So when we said we're going we're gonna to make international expansion, we're actually doing it. And Think about this, we announced more international expansion in three days from now. We will start our flights from Nairobi, into, from uh, Mumbai into Nairobi. First time ever Indigo is, is connecting India into Africa. The first time an Indigo aircraft is touching down on African soil, which is great. Two days later we start with direct flights from Mumbai into Jakarta. Again, two days later, we start flying from Delhi uh, into, into Baki, Baku and Tbilisi. Later, we ha are adding Almaty and Tashkent. So we keep on adding uh, that international network. And it's not only plans, it's actually coming in, into life. And with that, you see that our relative share of available seat kilometers is moving from the low 20s towards 30% of our network. And as we continue to build not only new destinations, also a lot of new routes are being added and some of the examples I gave earlier today is I mean we next week Friday we start direct flights from Ahmedabad into Abu Dhabi so we these are both existing destinations but we keep adding new routes and we're actually heading now towards a, a set of, of 100 different international routes which a few months ago was only 70 so from 70 to 100 international routes I think that speaks to what we're doing in terms of international development. What is the 
aspiration. You know, you said uh, that Indigo delivers on the talk, it walks the talk. What's the aspiration? What's the internal target on uh, what amount of revenue you expect from your international operations, say by 2025? Yeah, I, I think we're, we're not giving any guidance longer than, than 12 to 24 months because around the international development there are, there are significantly more uncertainties than they are for domestic. We need to get the air traffic rights, we need to get the slots, we need to get all the permissions. So in terms of precise percentages, uh, I would prefer to sort of uh, stick to one or two year outlooks and we have now moved from 20 to 30 percent or we will ending up in a range of 30 percent and that will continue to grow. The next phase really is, is the XLR coming in by the end of 24, early 25, which will further extend our range of, of flying. And then if you take, a, again, we could, we could start flying to places as Delhi, Athens and De Delhi, Rome and to Seoul, but not only new destinations, also a place like Delhi, uh, Delhi to Nairobi would then be possible, which today is connected Mumbai, Nairobi. So we can, we can further expand our network and, and really build on that international network profile. Then the precise percentage is going to be an outcome of that network development and not an objective in itself. Right. Uh, you know, that's as far as your international plans are concerned. I want to go back to the comment that you made about the strength of the domestic market and how you are seeing first time flyers uh, coming on board and you're seeing a growth within the market itself. Uh, now, what more can we expect uh, from Indigo, uh, especially when we talk about the Uran routes? Are the Uran routes now uh, minus the viability gap funding, uh, profitable routes? How do you see Indigo as the market leader expanding the domestic market? Yeah, well, thanks. It's, it's an important point. Of course, the, whereas we, we like to speak about our international expansion and, and the growing share, the very backbone and the very foundation of, of Indigo, obviously, is still our domestic market. And when we were speaking about the share uh, of, of available seat kilometers, clearly that's a high international. When we speak about individual customers, clearly the domestic is still the backbone. And, and the fact that, that we are now, and I should pronounce it correct, that we start flying into um, in Shimavoga uh, from Bangalore, that's really just our 79th domestic destination. So we keep expanding that domestic network um, earlier this year, we, we connected Delhi to the Ramshala. Now, we're not in fact only connecting Delhi to the Ramshala, but suddenly it connects over Delhi to a lot of different places. So our strategy domestic really will continue to add destinations and more so adding a number of routes. And um, I think another very interesting statistic actually is that today we operate a little over 500 routes uh, prior to COVID, that was 350 routes. So we have added uh, a total of a little short of 200 uh, new routes uh, since COVID, which I think speaks to what is our plans domestic. Adding new destinations, but even more so adding a whole range of new routes and making sure that all these customers who want to fly actually have the access to air travel. You know, speaking of uh, new opportunities, I also want to understand from you uh, on the freight aspiration as well, which is, of course, something that we saw uh, all airlines uh, focusing on through the COVID period. Now, where do things currently stand on that front and how big is that aspiration for you? Today, uh, maybe let's take a step back. Indigo has, has performed very well on cargo during COVID, like, in a, like actually a lot of other airlines. Uh, but with narrow body aircraft, it's a different setting. We do have in place today uh, two Airbus 321 freighters dedicated to that. Um, and in fact, we have quite a bit of cargo capacity on our uh, leased 777 aircraft uh, to Istanbul. That gives us the opportunity to get more experience also with that international cargo side. Later this year, we're expected to get a third freighter coming in. And with that, we start to build up our network. And basically, like a, um, similar to what we've done on the passenger side, it will take a bit of time before we have that whole network up and running, have established all our customer bases. Uh, but I'm very proud of what our cargo team really is doing and start to build from these two freighters. But not only the two freighters only, we do have 1,850-ish flight per day. And this 
ish flight per day are also having valley capacity. So we, we see with the growth of e-commerce in India, with the growth of some of the pharma industries, with a lot of growth going there, that going forward we still have a lot of aspirations and ambitions in that field. Um, having said that, it's taking us, of course, a bit of time to start to prepare and building on it. Uh, you know, speaking of building on new opportunities, uh a venture capital fund uh, that Indigo has uh, decided to announce. Uh, you're starting off uh, small, seven crore rupees. But what is this about? Uh, what is the bet that you in intend to make? Well, again, here we, we are becoming a, a global aviation player, and which in itself, in two days from now, we're celebrating our 17th anniversary. Uh, and, and I'm sure you've sh seen it going around. But... I, I don't think there's, there's many, if any, airline in the world which has grown from 17, uh, in 17 years from, from basically one flight to 1,850 a day and to this year hopefully 100 million customers. But with that 100 million customers and that size of the operation, we're in fact uh, uh, expanding also and making sure that we uh, work and collaborate with young, innovative, new startups and companies and for that, a fund like this um, could help us to work together, to collaborate and to see for opportunities to continue to be ahead of the pack and prepare actually Indigo for the next phase, which is not only domestic competition, but bringing Indigo more to a global player. And for that, I think India probably is one of the best places in the world to be with so much entrepreneurial spirit, uh, IT spirit, um, people who start up their own companies and a fund like this will help us to establish a more solid cooperation with some of these new startups. It's a new era for us, absolutely, uh, but I guess it speaks to the, to the entrepreneurship, not only of India, but also very much of Indigo. You know, you preempted my question. So is the focus largely going to be on collaborating with startups in the tech space? Uh, is this part of the plan to uh, uh, sort of plug gaps, if any, within the digitization journey that you intend to take? Uh, what will be the specific focus areas? We, we, have, we actually have, have not predetermined a specific focus area. The most important criteria is that it's linked to the operation and the, the core business of, of Indigo itself. But with that, one could think about the operation at airports, one could think about our customer interface, one could think about the way we approach our customers. And again here, obviously, digital will offer us a whole range of new initiatives and the new opportunities and possibilities. And the whole world is coming to India for its digital uh, enhancements and, and actually we're living here. This is, this is our home. So we're in the right spot to build on that. Uh, Peter, you know, let me end then by asking you, uh, what would you, outside of the engine issues which you've spoken of, what would you uh, count out or call out as possible risks today? And in terms of demand uh, as well as capacity, uh, what kind of pricing power does somebody like you enjoy today? Well, again, the demand is, is strong and, and we expect it to continue uh, to grow with the growth of the Indian economy. And I think today someone forwarded me a sort of risk of, of, of economic uh, reduction of, of forecasts and where, where, again, some countries were ranked high and India was ranked uh, uh, at the position of having a lower risk. So I think the whole, the whole outlook for Indian economy is pretty robust. Uh, if you look to international analysts and reviews. With a robust economic outlook, we can also feel that the demand outlook is, is strong and robust. Yes, there are seasonal patterns, and yes, there will be fluctuations, and there's always fluctuations. But I think the, the foundations are in itself are, are, are solid. You addressed the engine issue. That's obviously something we keep a very close eye on, and, and we will make sure as we have done in the past, that we can live up to our, our capacity guidance. And that's, I would say, our, our focus at this point in time. So I, I wouldn't add anything to the points you've mentioned, just underlining that that's a point where we put a lot of efforts and a lot of focus in. Peter Elbers, it's an absolute pleasure. Many thanks for joining us here on the record uh, to give us uh, 
uh, an indication of what the flight path ahead looks like and for uh, bringing in much needed clarity on a whole host of uh, supply related issues. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in person the next time. Appreciate your time. Absolutely. We do that. Thank you so much, Shireen. And see you next time in person indeed. Have a nice evening. You too. With that, it's time for us to wrap up this edition of On The Record. From all of us here on the team, goodbye and many thanks for watching. Listen to this carefully.